I believe that the progress of science is the greatest human achievement. Now, if you ask a scientist, what are you doing? How does science work? The scientist will often say, well, I go around and I find out about the world from experience. But it's not obvious that experience constitutes proof. So you might look at this and you might say, look, Karen, your tie is blue. It's not obvious that that constitutes science. So what I'm talking about in this series of videos is I'm talking about the logic of science, what science can and cannot tell us, how science works. Now, I'm talking about the philosophy of science. The most, one of the most influential philosophers of science is Karl Popper. And his most influential text about the philosophy of science is the logic of scientific discovery, which I'm going to be detailing in these three videos. Now, previously, when I've given a book summary, I've summarized the book in maybe 10 or 15 minutes. But having read through the book, I've come to the conclusion that if I was to do that, I would be giving you a real disservice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the book step by step explaining the logic behind the logic of scientific discovery so that you can understand it and then you can you can evaluate its arguments yourself. So what Popper is doing in the logic of scientific discovery, which was first published in German in 1934, is he's really trying to answer three questions. One, how does science find out about the world given that we always have limited experience. Two, what makes science different from non-science? So what are the methodological rules that define science? And thirdly, how does science handle probability and, and random like behavior? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have one video for each of those three questions. So first of all, in this video, I'm going to talk about the logic of what experience can and cannot tell us. Now, I'm going to begin by defining some logical terms. So first of all, there are two kinds of logic, two kinds of reasoning that we should know about. One is deduction and the other is induction. So deduction means knowing things with certainty given the premises. So I might say, if we know one and two, we can work out three. So if we know one, all teachers wear suits, and two, Kieran is a teacher, then we can work out three, Kieran is wearing a suit. That is a deductive argument. If one and two are true, three is always true. It can't not be true. But it assumes that one and two are true. It assumes the premises are true. Because the first premise, all teachers wear suits, isn't true, and so the conclusion can't be true. So the point I'm making about deduction is that it's always valid, but it's not necessarily true. It's only true if the premises are true. So that's deduction. The other way to know about the world is, or at least the other way discussed in the book, is induction. So what is induction? Induction means generalizing from limited experience. So if I say, I see a bunch of swans and yeah, they're all, they're all white swans. I can generalize from that and say all swans are white. That's induction. Okay, so what logical, uh, what kind of reasoning, induction or deduction, does science use? Now, the older idea, going back to the philosopher Francis Bacon, is that science only used induction. So the inductivist idea, Popper calls it the inductivist idea, is that the inductivist idea is science only uses induction, observes a lot of things, and then lets nature speak for itself. Science lets nature speak for itself. You just measure a bunch of things, or you just observe a bunch of things, and that's all you have to do. Well, there are some limitations of that, and I've discussed this previously in my summary of Thomas Kuhn's The, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions. So, first of all, Induction from experience isn't enough. What you need is you need some theory because your theory is going to determine one, what you're actually measuring and two, your interpretation of your data. So if I find, look, there's a positive correlation between A and B, then maybe 
A causes B, maybe B causes A, maybe they're caused by C. How I interpret that will depend on my theory and also, and also, my theory is the thing that's going to get me to measure A and B in the first place. And as well as that, it's not good enough for science just to talk about the things that we've measured. What we want to do is we want to find out about the things that we haven't measured and make deductive predictions. So we want to predict about things we haven't measured. So induction by itself isn't enough. Well, this leads me to talk about a school of philosophy of science called logical positivism. Logical positivism says that science uses both induction and deduction. The reason I'm talking about logical positivism is this is the school of philosophy which Karl Popper is responding to and reacting against. So the positivists, logical positivists, say that science uses induction and deduction and can verify claims, can prove claims true. Now, logical positivism is explained in part by the name. So positive means positive evidence. So we know about the world from experience, from evidence, and also we use logic, we use deduction. So here's the idea. And I'm going to give an example from physics because throughout the book, Popper is giving the examples of physics, primarily Einstein's general relativity and also quantum mechanics. So here's an example in physics. Let's say we're looking at the relationship between force and mass. So the scientist has a whole bunch of of balls, you know, might be a tennis ball, might be a golf ball, might be a, a cannonball with different mass. So the balls have different mass and throws those balls or drops them and finds out the force, how, um, how hard does it smash on the ground? And the scientist does this and plots this in a graph and might find the higher the force, the higher the mass, the higher the force, might find a positive trend. So that's observation. What the logical positivists say is the scientists then use induction to generalize their observations into a logical statement. So the logical statement, the higher the force is associated with the higher mass. An example of that would be Newton's equation F equals MA, higher the force, higher the mass. That equation also accounts for acceleration, which is how fast things speed up. So the idea is we start with observations and then you turn that into a logical statement. And then you can use the logical statement to deduce other things. So if I know that something has a really high mass, I can also say that it has a, a really high force when you drop it. Okay, so I'm using induction to turn a observation, a set of observations into a logical statement from which I can deduce other logical statements. If I know one and two, I can work out three. How do we know one and two? Well, I use experience induction to find out one and two, then I use deduction to work out three from that. And that's logical positivism. And Popper says they're wrong. So the logical positivists are saying we use induction and deduction, Popper says no. Popper says that the use of induction in science is simply unacceptable. Now, Popper is responding to a serious philosophical problem in science, which is called the problem of induction, which was posed, among others, by the Scottish philosopher David Hume. And David Hume, who was writing in the mid-1700s, he wrote about how induction doesn't work. The problem of induction, you can't use induction. So here's how it works. No amount of limited experience allows you to generalize outside what you've already experienced. Throughout the book, he uses the example of swans. I'm going to use the example of swans. Philosophers like this example. So if I see a lot of swans, I see 10 white swans, 100 white swans, 1,000 white swans. It doesn't matter how many white swans I see. I can never prove that all swans are white. I can't do that. At some point, somewhere in the world, there may be a black swan. In fact, in Europe, it was believed for thousands of years that all swans were white until, um, until uh, the people in Europe learned that they were black swans in Australia. So that's the problem of induction, because the whole idea of induction, the whole idea of induction is you go from the things that we know, the things we've measured, and you generalize to the things you don't know. 
But that only makes sense. That only makes sense if you first assume that the things that you've measured are similar to the things that you haven't. But you can't do that because, well, because you haven't measured those things. Now, I want to be very emphatic about this point. So the problem of induction, it doesn't just mean that induction is uncertain. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying instead is there is no logical reason to trust induction in any way. You've seen the sun come up, you've seen the com sun come down in a given 24 hour period. Maybe you've seen that thousands of times in your life. Just because that's happened before, you have no reason to think that's going to happen again. Now, you might think that that's a bit of a silly point because of course the sun is going to rise tomorrow. And maybe you have a very strong subjective belief that that will happen. Maybe seeing thousands of white swans, you'll have a very strong subjective belief that all swans are white. But you can't prove it. You have a strong feeling of confidence, but as far as Popper is concerned, confidence isn't good enough for science. Science should prove things right or should prove things wrong. A Popper has a great deal of respect for science, and this is why he's holding it up to such a high, uh, rigorous standard of logic. Okay, so what Popper does now is he wants to find out what things can we actually know from experience. And he sets up a set of different statements about the world that you could prove true, verify, or prove wrong, falsify with experience. So a statement is a claim, such as a fact or a hypothesis, a claim about the world. Now, the simplest is what he calls a basic statement, which is just a fact. A simple fact, a claim about one thing. So I could say that swan there is white. Now, that claim can be proven true. It can be verified by looking at it and saying, yep, it's a white swan. The claim can also be falsified by looking at it and say, actually, it's not a white swan, it's a black swan. So a claim about one thing can be true, proven true or false. So far, so good. Okay, what about a claim about a bunch of things? This is what Popper calls a numerically universal statement. A claim about a bunch of things. For example, all the swans on this lake at this time. So it's a bunch of things bounded in a particular space and time. Well, if you had enough time, you could go around the lake and look at all the swans in the lake. And if all the swans on the lake are white, you can prove the statement true. But if not all the swans are white, then you prove it false. So, yep, we can verify and falsify that so far. So far, so good. That might be good enough for someone who just wants to describe what they've seen of the world. But science has a higher standard. What science wants to do is predict other things. Science wants to make predictions. Science doesn't just want to say this is true of the world. Science wants to make predictions to explain the world because if you predict something, it means that you can explain it. Now, science is in the business of making what Popper calls a strictly universal claim, a natural law, a theory which is true across all places and across all times. A theory that's true wherever you are um, and whatever time it happens to be. So when physicists say that this is the law of gravity, or when physicists say F equals MA, they don't mean it's true here today, they mean it's true at all times and at all places. Now, let's take an example of the swans. Well, that would be a statement like, all swans are white. Okay, well, how would you prove that true? Well, what you could do is you could, you could see a bunch of white swans. And you might say, is it enough that I've seen a bunch of white swans? Can't I just call it a day and say, all swans are white? I do have some evidence that there are white swans, but Papa says no. It's not enough that you have some evidence for a claim. And the reason for that is that you can find some evidence for any claim, no matter how, how stupid or how wrong the claim is. We all know, we all know that smoking is bad for you and that smoking kills. But it's always possible to point to one person, look over here, my, I don't know, great Auntie Mildred lived to, I'm making this up, 
50 cigarettes a day. She smoked 50 cigarettes a day and lived to the year 149. It's always possible to find some evidence in favor of any stupid claim. So the logical positivists, and the inductivists, the people who think that science is based on induction, have the idea that, that evidence is rare and evidence is valuable. And Popper says, no, you can find evidence to support any idea. This is uh, similar to what the economist Ronald Coase said, which is that if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. If you try hard enough, you can find evidence for any claim. And so the fact we've seen a bunch of white swans isn't enough to say all swans are white. What would we need to do to prove all swans are white? Well, we'd have to look at all the swans that exist now and all the swans that could exist in the future and could exist in the past and in all the places. So here and on Jupiter and in the nebulas of the pillars of creation. So not only would we have to travel through all of space, we'd have to go forward and back in time to say about all the swans, because maybe there was a black swan far away a long time ago. But that's just not possible, because we're always dealing with limited information. And because of the problem of induction, we can't generalize from that limited information. It can't be done. And what that means is that the statement, all swans are white, cannot be verified, can't be proven true. This isn't just the case with the example of the swan. This is true for any natural law, any universal law. And these universal laws tend to be in the form all X is Y, like all swans are white, all F equals MA. You can't prove it true because that would require proving it in an infinite number of situations. Because if I say all, if it's an all statement, like that, like a law is, it implies that it's true in an infinite amount of times and an infinite amount of places. And you just can't test that. But what you can do, however, is you can falsify it. You can prove it wrong. And how do you prove it wrong? Very simply, there is a black swan. And so you can't prove a statement true, but you can prove a statement wrong. The last statement I'm going to talk about is a strictly existential statement. And a strictly existential statement is a statement says that says such and such a thing exists. So there is a black swan somewhere. Now, that's a verifiable statement. Look, there's a black swan, but it's not falsifiable. You can't prove it wrong. Because if I say I can't see the black swan, the scientist over there who believes in black swans could say, oh, did you look over there? Did you look on Jupiter for the black swan? So you can't prove it wrong. The point is that a statement such and such a thing does exist somewhere can be proven true. And it's actually the existence of that thing would just be a simple fact. It would be a basic statement like we talked about before, which we can true, prove true or false. So if I make the statement, all swans are white, what I'm really saying is there are no black swans, which I can prove wrong. Okay, so what this means is that because science is trying to find these universal claims, these, these natural laws, but as well as that, it can't verify them, it can only prove them wrong. And what that means is that every scientific theory, by definition, is really just a hypothesis. It's just an idea about the world that we can't prove true. And that's true about the white swans, and that's true about the laws of physics, and that's true about the existence of gravity and the sunrise tomorrow. Okay, so that's a real logical problem. So is Popper saying we should give up on science? Absolutely not. Because, well, science can't tell us anything for certain. Why would we bother with science? Well, science nevertheless is unbelievably effective. You are able to watch this video on your telephone because one, you can you are able to get the signal from satellites, which science put in space. And also your telephone works because it's full of transistors, which work because of quantum mechanics, which is a scientific theory, which measures things that we can't even see. Evidently science is doing things right, but it's not doing it with induction. And so what I'm going to talk about in the next video is about what exactly is it that science is doing right to find out about the world, given that it's using limited information.